Hello there, Winston Buckley here, owner of Buckley Tech Services and Crypt Academy, and this is this week's market updates. If you don't mind, please like, follow, and subscribe, whether you're listening on YouTube, Facebook, Data TV, Audius, or Twitter. First, we have a disclaimer. We are not licensed financial advisors. The opinions expressed are for general informational purposes only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any security, blockchain, coin, token, or investment product. It is only intended to provide education about the digital world and financial industry. Please do your own research and consult a licensed professional if you plan to invest in the future. The views reflected in the commentary are subject to change at any time without notice. All right, so we got that out the way. So we got some upcoming conferences. I'm here in Atlanta, Georgia. If you didn't know, there's something that's pretty big that's coming up that's called InvestFest, which is August 27th through the 29th, 2021, in case you're listening in 2022 or beyond. Uh, but it's not just about crypto. There's going to be topics about real estate, the stock market, many other fields as well. But crypto will be covered. So really interesting thing that we have going on later on this month in Atlanta. In Europe, there's going to be Money 2020. And also the Blockchain Expo. So those are going to be in Europe in September. There's Mainnet 2021 and NFT NYC in New York. A couple of that are online are Crypto Mastery Summit and Club Fest. That's a digital e-commerce conference. And then in Washington, D.C. in September, there's the Government Blockchain Week. So we've been following CBDCs and crypto. So CBDCs, for those who don't know, are central bank digital coins. The Federal Reserve Governor Leo Brainard has said that the proliferation of stable coins could fragment the payment system without a digital dollar. So the digital dollar that she's referring to is a U.S. digital dollar. Now, we already have one to a certain degree. I mean, most of the times then when we're going to the store, we're using a form of the digital dollar, a digital representation of the fiat dollar that we already have. But she's specifically talking about a central bank digital coin, so a U.S. blockchain coin. Now, some feel that stable coins aren't necessarily bad in themselves, but they need to be partnered with a central bank coin. And I think the concern is since the U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency, then a CBDC, a blockchain coin that represents the U.S. dollar should be the world's reserve currency. And that's in some people's opinion, because 80 percent of the central banks around the world are looking to implement a digital dollar of their own. So let's say if China is the first country to have their own digital dollar that could threaten the U.S.'s status as the world's reserve currency. So that's a concern that's out there. Whether that's a good or bad thing, I'll leave that up to you to decide, but that's where we are. Now, we've been keeping up with inflation, and I haven't gotten July 2021's inflation report yet for here in the U.S., but in June it was at 5.4%, so we covered that last time we met, and that's the highest since 2008. So some are wondering, will the Fed reverse course and buying assets and printing money. But it, it doesn't look like that's going to happen anytime soon because even though we are at highs in the stock market, we're still in a recession. So it doesn't look like a recession on paper, but we are in the middle of a pandemic and unemployment is still a factor. Everywhere that I go, there are hiring signs all over the place. So I don't know what customer service has been like in your neck of the woods, but here it's, it's been suffering a lot because restaurants are short staffed, grocery stores are short staffed, and people just cannot keep up the, the level of service that we're used to. So this is really interesting what's going to happen. Will the Fed reverse course and start to increase the Fed's fund rate to try to tame inflation? I am speculating that it's going to be higher again in July, but we don't know. So we shall see. We'll, we'll see what the response is if inflation just continues to go up month after month in this year as it has been all of 2021. So here are some of the ladies, latest developments. So I got a picture here of Moneybag Joe. That's what they're calling him because he's spending so much money so quickly. And if you don't know, there is a proposal for an infrastructure bill at the tune of $1 trillion and $28 billion of that is supposed to be collected from cryptocurrency. 
Now, in on one hand, that, that may sound good. Of course, if, if anybody's making money on any asset, they have to pay taxes on that. And that's that's just the way the law is written. And right now, digital currencies are considered property. So they are taxed like property. But there was some language that was in that bill that was a little concerning because it was requesting that any platform and they even said companies that do any transactions in crypto would need to do KYC or know your customer policies and they would have to implement certain things in order to report all those transactions in order for the U.S. to collect to, to collect tax on that. Now, part of that is a concern for those in the crypto community because let's say you're all about your privacy and therefore you transact in Monero, for example, which is a privacy coin. It's kind of difficult and, and it may be impossible to even record transactions on that because it's decentralized. The same for DeFi protocol. So Uniswap, yes, they have a development team, but everything is on a smart contract. So even the language in the original proposal of this bill is not even enforceable. And some people have called that out as well. Now, there's also something that was proposed, which is the digital asset market structure, structure and investment protection act of 2021, which had some language in there to regulate digital assets and, and also talked about uh, taxation of that. But there's been a lot of pushback on that. Uh, some from Brian Armstrong, the CEO of Coinbase. He says on his Twitter account, this makes no sense. Smart contracts, for instance, are not companies and cannot be modified to collect KYC info or issue 1099s. They are simply software running on the blockchain that anyone can use. So those of you that are familiar with the space, you know that most of this runs autonomous, excuse me, autonomous, autonomously on the blockchain. So there's not really a company to go to. And if there are KYC protocols that are implemented and that's the standard for anything to run in the US as far as a protocol, then it would just shut DeFi down altogether. Most most of crypto, it would just shut it down. It will instantly make it illegal. Now, when I say shut it down, I'll say in the mainstream because crypto is going to live, blockchain is going to live on no matter what happens. And we see that in other countries like China, for example, where they have bans. However, Bitcoin is still being transacted because you cannot stop the blockchain unless you stop electricity and the internet itself. So because of that, Senator Pat Toomey, he has recognized that and he stated Congress should not rush forward with this hastily designed tax reporting regime for cryptocurrency, especially without a full understanding of the consequences. And so he's proposed, along with some other senators, a, a amendment to that infrastructure bill because for one is unenforceable, but then two, many constituents all around the country have been texting, emailing, calling their senators and their reps saying, hey, this is an invasion of our privacy and it's, it's unrealistic. So there has been proposals by him and some others, which there was some agreements on, some disagreements. So at this point is is holding up that infrastructure bill, which is interesting. I, I pulled up CNBC.com and it was the first article on there and it was related to crypto. So it just goes to show just how important this space is. So some of my friends that I, I'm trying to convince about crypto, you know, I get it. Most people don't understand it. I don't understand how the internet, internet works totally. So I, I get it. So there's, there's a lot of tech stuff that's in there. There's a lot of blockchain back in stuff that people are just like, dude, this makes no sense to me. But it goes to show just how influential, important, and really how, how much it just shows how much the blockchain is a part of our society is an integral part of our society. So it's here, it's here to stay, but it's just something to see that that has been something that's been holding up a $1 trillion bill. So I'm gonna just quickly touch on how a bill becomes law. So whether a bill is introduced or proposed, that doesn't make it law. So sometimes the news can be a little sensational. They'll put something and say breaking news in this proposal, but a lot of times I think people think that that means that it's a law automatically and that's not how it works. So this process is 
for the most part, the same state to state and on the federal level. So if a bill is introduced, whether that's in the House or the Senate, it has to go through its committee. And if it's approved, it goes to the other chamber. So if it starts in the Senate, then it has to go over to the House. If it starts in the House, it goes over to the Senate. From there, if they reach an agreement, usually it goes through different iterations and different amendments are, are made to it because of language like it was in that original infrastructure bill that just it just didn't make sense. So there's a lot of back and forth. If they can come up with a bill that they both agree to for the most part, because there's still going to be a lot of disagreement that then is passed on to the the authority to sign. So if it's in the state, that would be the governor. And if it's on a federal level, it will leave both chambers and go to the president where he can veto or sign the bill into law. So that, I think that's just important to know because a lot of times we can get a little sidetracked by a proposed bill. It doesn't necessarily make it law. So some also some uh, latest developments. Uh, this was on CNBC. And so if you're listening, I know you can't see this clip here, but I have this <laughs> Patrick Swayze is lost in, in Pulp Fiction just to show how the quote unquote experts are really lost <laughs> in, in the crypto world. Not all of them. Some of them know what they're talking about. But when you're watching the news, the mainstream news, or you're listening to mainstream talk radio, just because they're experts in financial industries and in the stock market and futures forex different areas that does not make them experts in crypto so i'm going to play this clip here and hopefully you guys can hear it well from brian kelly on cnbc the biggest thing that's happening to ethereum is there there it's an upgrade it's called eip 1559 for those tech savvy folks that want to look at it but basically what it does is it switches the algorithm from a proof of work to a proof of stake so it uses less electricity to mine but the more important thing is they're actually changing their monetary policy so now it all sounds good if you if you don't know anything about ethereum Hey, he sounds like he knows what he's talking about. But Michael Wong called him out on Twitter. For one, he pointed out that Brian Kelly has a chart up for Ethereum Classic. Now, I'm not going to put it all on him. Maybe it was somebody on the team on Fast Money at CNBC. But they had a chart of Ethereum Classic while he's talking about Ethereum. Ethereum Classic is not Ethereum. It's two, two separate coins. Two totally, totally different coins. Okay, and let me let me be technically correct. Tokens. All right. So it's two different blockchains. Also, he said that EIP fifteen fifty nine. So EIP is an Ethereum improvement proposal. So this was voted on. That proposal passed, has been implemented. Fifteen fifty nine does not change Ethereum from proof of work to proof of stake. <laughs> that that does not happen. That doesn't happen until Ethereum two point is fully implemented. So that's wrong as well. And I'm, I'm not doing this to pick him apart because we all make mistakes. Anybody that reports anything that does public presentations, like me, I'm, I'm presenting information at this point. Somebody can come and pick this apart. So I'm not trying to do this to pick him apart. But I, I'm, I'm trying to prove the point that you need to do research for yourself. And I had to do it for myself as well. So EIP 1559 does not move Ethereum from proof of work to proof of stake. That, that doesn't happen. And he referred to Ethereum like it was a company. And Ethereum is, is decentralized. There, there are some people that have more of a stake in Ethereum than others. There are, there are people that own, own more of that token than others. But it's not a company. There is a team of developers, but it's a decentralized protocol. So what EIP 1559 does is it sets standards around transaction fees. So it moves from all of the transaction fee going to the validators where just the tip a portion of the fee goes to the validator and it sets a max fee. Now, some were wondering if this was going to reduce fees and I can tell you it hasn't because I tried to transact on Ethereum and one transaction was gonna cost $23. So it doesn't reduce the, the gas fees. But it does increase the block size, which could be beneficial during time of congestion. 
so that's one thing that that's a little different. Every block size was the same, but now there can be variable block sizes. So a block size can be increased during high volume times, which may help the the speed in certain cases. But this is really not a speed booster. But one of the most important things is that it does implement a burn feature. So he was right on that. And this is a, a snapshot that was taken on August 6th where it shows that over 6,000 ETH have been burned. And that's very important. And, and, and at this point, over 10,000 ETH have been burned. So it doesn't make it net deflationary at this point, but once we move to proof of stake, Ethereum may in fact become an overall or a net deflationary token. And that's really important for the tokenomics of this token. So one thing that makes Bitcoin so special and so valuable is that we know what the max amount of bitcoin is going to be 21 million and it's deflationary in its nature because some people are going to lose their bitcoin there there is a guy who has hundreds of millions of dollars of mined bitcoin that's in the dumpster somewhere in europe and he's been trying to find that for years maybe he's close maybe not but unfortunately some people pass on and their their private keys are are They've gone with them. Nobody knows how to access their accounts. Some people lose their passwords, can't get into the accounts. Uh, ledgers are thrown out by mistake. So that's what's uh, that's why Bitcoin is where it is. But Ethereum, kind of the highway of of crypto, uh, some some people can refer to it as that, will at some point become net deflationary. So that's uh, something that's very could be very bullish for Ethereum. Now, some more developments. Goldman Sachs has filed for a DeFi trust. Uh, some people have called it for a DeFi ETF, and that's why I put that there. But it's, it's a trust fund for DeFi. Now, on paper, this, this, is a, this is a great ETF. There's Nokia, Facebook, Alphabet, Accenture, Fujitsu, Visa, Microsoft, MasterCard, PayPal, Siemens, Intel, Sony, Overstock, Alibaba. This is a, this is a great ETF. But where's the DeFi? There's no DeFi in here. There's no Uniswap. There's no Aave. There's no Compound. There's no Synthetics. There's no DYDX. There's no SushiSwap. There's, there's not one DeFi protocol. And that's because you cannot directly offer DeFi on the stock market yet. There are, there are some, some, some ways that I'm starting to see where it's kind of offered. But this, this has nothing to do with DeFi. This is a list of some companies that have some footprint in crypto, but this is not a DeFi ETF. So I don't know what's going on with that. But Grayscale, thankfully, Grayscale is in the space and they have issued a trust that has Uniswap, Compound, Maker, Synthetics, Ave, Curve, Sushi, Yearn, Bancor, amongst others in there. And so that is that is very important grayscale really they, they really have their finger on the pulse they know what they're doing and of course any of these these shares and this trust is sold at a premium that represents these assets so you're only getting a percentage but for those that don't want to go on a DeFi platform because they either don't know what they're doing or don't trust it this is a, a pretty much a great liaison into the world of crypto so uh that is not any investment advice but this is this is very 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 good news for the DeFi space so I, I brought up those examples about Goldman and CNBC because you're needed in the space if you have some base knowledge about crypto and you've been in the space for a while we need you and companies need you the governments need you we need you to be in this space so here's a, a job ad that I pulled up from circle circle is a huge company in the crypto space they issue usdc which is a stable coin and is is at some point it's probably going to outgrow tether but in the us it's the biggest stable coin and it has the fastest growth of any stable coin but in this job description they said that you'll need to bring deep knowledge of our fintech space demonstrate credentials as a thought leader have three plus years experience working in a relevant area of the digital currency and payments industry so what exactly is that? That is so broad. That's so broad. So you can be an expert in this space if you've been in it for a while and you can demonstrate that you have 
sufficient knowledge about how it works. So get busy, start your own company, work for a company, or just, just fumble around in the space. Learn about DeFi, learn about C5 for that example, learn what Bitcoin is, learn about the blockchain, learn about different tokens. This, this is a, a, a space where it's, it's going to grow and it's going to keep growing and keep growing. And, and you don't have to do this full time. You know, you can you can do this really just a couple of hours a day at the, at the end of your day. I know most of us have full time jobs and we're working all day. And it's like, well, how do I start something new? But an hour or two of research a day, you, you'd be surprised how much you will learn about this space or any other, if, even if you're not interested in this. But I, w I would highly recommend just to learn more about this space if you don't know anything. And even if you do, just keep digging deeper. So some other latest developments, BlockFi has been getting a lot of static from New Jersey, Kentucky, Vermont, Texas, Alabama. And they, they're saying that BlockFi has broken some of the regulatory security rules in those states because they're issuing uh, security in those states without the permission of those regulatory bodies. And basically, BlockFi is giving high interest on stable coins and other cryptos. And BlockFi doesn't have their, their own token, but Celsius, for example, has like the, the Celsius token, right? Now, this is my opinion. So again, I'm from New Orleans. I've mentioned that in, in episodes before. We like our uh, our current, uh, excuse me, conspiracies, <laughs> currency. <laughs> we like our conspiracy. So here's my tenfold hat a moment. I, I just think that the banks have seen that they're losing some market share to CFI and DeFi. And there's there's no banks around that are offering 5%, 10%, 15% on a savings account or a checking account, a CD, any, any of those products without being in the market. So some people are saying, well, hey, there's a stable coin that's pegged one to one to the dollar and I can get 8% interest on it, man, I'm, I'm gonna take my money out this bank and, and go put it over there. And so I, I think that we're starting to see this fight between traditional banks and CFI and DeFi. And uh, they're, they're kind of using the, the <laughs> they're, they're lobbying to uh, get that done. But that's, that's, that's just based on my hunch. Don't take that to the bank. See how I did that? All right, some other developments. The XRP, they might be reaching a settlement soon with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Now, this is just based on a, a bunch of hearsay, but some people have said that they've never seen a case play out like this where there's a, a little trouble defining exactly what's a security as far as crypto goes. So it's already been deemed that Ethereum is not a security, but XRP is arguing, well, what makes XRP a security and what makes Ethereum not? So they've been able to secure a lot of information about previous filings, previous cases, and also they've gotten documents about Binance uh, from the SEC. So that's a big deal. Now, we, we might see a settlement soon. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Maybe this year, maybe later. But these, these things take time. So really interesting what's going on in that space. Now, XRP... A lot of people, those people that are in the XRP army, they feel like XRP is going to overtake Swift. And, and one guy even told me that he feels like XRP is the true Bitcoin. I, I really disagree with that. But Swift, if you don't know, Swift handles international wire payments, amongst other things. But they transmit money across the world. And that's been the system that we've been using for decades in the bank. But they have something called Swift Go, and they partner with BIS and they know that XRP is coming for them along with Stellar Lumens and some others for that transmittal space. They're not going to go out without, without a fight. So they've been speeding up their network. They've been making agreements. And so we're going to see where SWIFT is going to land with this and if XRP is going to bump them out of their space. Or maybe there might be a merger. Everything is merging nowadays. So we'll see. Now, Ave is doing something really cool. And Ave is based out of, in, in Europe, but they have something that's called Ave Arc. So they changed their Ave Pro protocol to Ave Arc. And they want to be the liaison between the DeFi space and the traditional financial space. So they want to have products where the bank can offer to 
to retail and uh, accredited investors well, where they can have access to DeFi products maybe directly or indirectly. So that might be a way that the bank can't offer a 5% interest product, but the customer may not even know that's a, that's a DeFi product. So the bank can issue their insurances with, and this is this would be in Europe since it's Ave, but they may be doing it in the US as well. So their version of the FDIC, they may be able to layer that on top of a DeFi coin or a DeFi token. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see what's going to come out of that. That's going to be very interesting. Now, there's also been some, this, this is more than rumors. Uniswap kind of said this. Uh, there's some of the development team have admitted this, but they supposedly have taken down some videos where they were talking about they were possibly doing some things with Robinhood, E-Trade, and PayPal where DeFi products could be offered through those protocols. Now, that is huge that is huge and since then uniswap has taken off some of their highly leveraged products or, or not products but tokens so there are some tokens that are leveraged in themselves so it might be a bitcoin 10x or a bitcoin 100x leverage token so their protocol uniswap protocol has removed them but you still have access to that but really interesting that they're mosing up to some of these companies now speaking of mosing up there's been some serious backing of Paxos, the stable coin from Bank of America, PayPal, and FTX exchange in Series D funding. So Pax, Paxos is another stable coin, just like USDC, just like Tether. Man, maybe I shouldn't say just like them because Tether, we don't know if they really have one-to-one. -one. Well, we know at this point that they don't have one-to-one -one in uh, the US dollar or any other dollar for that matter. But to see that companies like this, FTX is a cryptocurrency exchange, but PayPal and Bank of America, more traditional companies backing Paxos, it just further strengthens what stable coins mean, where their place is going to be. And we're going to see the reversal where you're going to start to see, and this is my opinion, you're going to start to see stable coins at a Bank of America, at a PayPal. So speaking of PayPal, PayPal is trying to develop a super app. So PayPal wants to take messaging. They want to take buy now, pay later. They want to take buying and selling crypto, transferring crypto, amongst other things, all in one platform. So we, we've seen this before from Facebook and others where they want you to do everything in their platform. Now, whoever does it best and whoever does it first, not only best, but sometimes just being first. If PayPal does this with their market share, with their partnerships like through ebay and some others this could be a really big deal so paypal they they know what they're doing and they have they have the they have the bags to back up creating a super app so look out for that more in partnerships we talked about circle but circle uh, has a partnership with unstoppable domains where people can get paid in usdc through their unstoppable domain platform so you might want to check out Unstoppable Domains. You, if you have a website, you can get paid in crypto with an Unstoppable Domain name. So that's something to check out. I have no sponsorship from Unstoppable. It would be nice. So Unstoppable, if you see this, I, I will gladly take uh, any sponsorships. Uh, but that's also uh, something that's happened with Crypto.com. Crypto.com has a bunch of partnerships. But now people can transfer their USDC which is one-to-one -to, -one to the US dollar directly to a bank account and it will automatically convert one-to-one. -one. So really interesting partnerships that's going on there. And then Square, really huge payment processor. On top of the Bitcoin protocol, they want to issue DeFi. And so it's that's gonna be interesting because if anybody who's done transactions on the Bitcoin protocol, you, you know how slow it is. And if you're trying to transact quickly, in the DeFi space, which moves very fast, interest rates move extremely fast, gas fees move very fast, and that's on Ethereum and, and other platforms, other protocols, other blockchains. I'm not sure how it's gonna work at this point on Bitcoin. Now, there's Lightning Network and there's Taproot and other things that are supposed to help make this protocol, make blockchain on make the excuse me make the bitcoin blockchain faster but it's, it's just not there yet but 
Square has a lot of money, so they probably can put a crazy team of developers behind making making this happen. Continuing in the vein of partnership, Shopify will be a gateway for Binance users to make payments. So those that use Binance Pay will be able to use Shopify in order to buy NFTs amongst other things. So you can spend your crypto to buy NFTs and use Shopify. Now I have this link here to the Chicago Bulls because the Bulls have issued an NFT on top of the Flow platform, the Flow uh, blockchain, and they have their own version of, of NFTs. And uh, from what I saw, it was some championship ring NFTs. So from those six rings that Jordan got in the 90s, I tried to get one. It was sold out by the time I got to it. But Holly Filk Filkenstein said, if you spent one minute on the Internet this year, you've seen a lot about NFTs. Shopify, we are making it easier for our merchants to sell NFTs directly through their stores with one of the first being at Chicago Bulls NFT store. So uh, that's at nft.bulls.com if you want to check that out. Now, Binance is they've, they've been on the fire, but Binance is they're 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 still crushing it. And the BNB token, you can see it in their price action that they've been doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes. But Malaysia recently said that they had 14 days and that was as of July 26, 2021. They had 14 days to get out the country. So I'm not sure where Binance is going to land. So many other countries said that Binance cannot set up their headquarters there. Now, this is separate from Binance US and Binance Brazil and others, but the original Binance, Binance.com, they have to find a home. So they right now they are they're they're vagabonds. I, I don't know. Uh, but Binance, I think they're gonna survive all of the multinational, multi-governmental attacks that they're under right now. Now moving on to the continent of Africa, uh, you know I like to cover things that's going on with the country of excuse me, the continent of Africa because there there's just so much crypto development that's going on there you know it's, it's it's a continent full of countries that are what are considered emerging markets and there's no shortage of developers there yeah I mean it, the things that are happening in crypto in Africa are really a, ahead of many developed nations like you know what we consider here in the US and in countries in Europe but a lot of people are already transacting in Bitcoin and, and other ones, uh, some some that I'm not really a fan of, but Electronium and, and some others. But Acoin is by Acon. Acon has his own token, Acoin. And so he has a partnership with a hospital there. And so I'm going to quote this. A major launch event scheduled for September will include the launch of a new hospital wing in the MMTC and the activation of Acorn across 5,000 bids at the Hamptons Hospital and 30,000 transactions per month. 30,000 transactions per month utilizing Acorn's atomic swap technology, merchant services, and Acorn credit and debit cards. That is a huge deal. So if you don't know, in Senegal, Acorn is building his own city that's going to be powered by a coin is going to be the official currency of the city that he's building. And we're starting to see it implemented in other places. This MMTC, MMTC is in Kenya. And so he's starting to branch out beyond the country. Uh, excuse me, not only the country. I keep saying country in, in a chain of belief with continent throughout the continent of Africa. Now, if you don't know about a coin, he has something that's called Lighting Africa, where he has a billion dollar line of credit with China to build electric infrastructure throughout the continent of Africa. So he lit up, literally lit up places for the first time ever. So something to, to really keep your eye on. And, and if you listen to this, you can't see this gift that I have up here, but it's a scene from coming to America where the father is telling the daughter, the boy has his own money. And so Acorn has his own money. So we like to talk about some crypto swag. So what we got? So Nas the Rapper has issued an NFT, the One Love NFT in commemoration of the Illmatic release, which was in conjunction of celebrating 
the 20th year anniversary of the ending of apartheid down in South Africa. So there's been this NFT to commemorate that 20th year anniversary of both that album and uh, the end of apartheid uh, down in South Africa. So that's that's a really cool project that that he's done. And uh, I think it's, it's sold for tens of thousands of dollars, uh, that NFT, which will, of course, be resold over and over uh, in time and will become more than likely more expensive. So uh, I can't afford one. But hey, if, if you can go out and get you a nice NFT. Now, Crypto.com, I talked about their partnerships. Now, they have a trading race. It's still going on. It ends on the 13th, but you can win $15,000. And this is USD. This is not USDC. This is not another crypto, but $15,000 if you have the most volume in NFT trading. So if you have that kind of bag, go ahead. And they also have been issuing NFTs on their platform, partnering with different digital artists and music artists. So one that they recently issued was this one which is the peanut butter jelly NFT. And this was a, a song by the Buckley Boys, which is a little annoying it's to peanut some, butter but jelly I'll play time, just a little bit. So uh, that was just kind of funny, <laughs> a, a funny NFT. And that was a whole dance and a movement that went with that uh, back, in, back in the day. All right, now this is uh, a little dated. This this picture I have up here of Crypto Slam, but I wanted to highlight Crypto Punks. Now, when I say dated, Crypto moves so fast. So this this picture, this snapshot is only six days old. But Crypto Punks had over two hundred and fifteen million dollars in sales in seven days. Right under them, Axie Infinity with two hundred and six million, Art Blocks fifty one million. Board Eight Yacht Club, which is really interesting. There, there are all kind of celebrities, athletes that are buying these board apes. Me Bits with twenty five million curio cars, eleven million. The Board Eight Kennel Club with over eight million and V Friends. And so you might want to check out some of those projects to see what's going on. But people are making crazy, crazy money in that. Now, some of these crypto punks are selling for millions of dollars. That's right, millions of dollars digital. NFTs selling for millions of dollars. So some people can take that and fractionalize that NFT and then sell it. So imagine if you had enough money to buy a $10 million NFT, you could then take that NFT, fractionalize it on a platform like NFTFY, and then you can sell fractions of that NFT. So people can buy let's say $10,000 worth of that NFT, and then that can grow in value. So just like a stock can split, uh, a company like Apple may split their stock and sell it. Well, that's what you can do with a really expensive or maybe a not so expensive NFT. And then on NFT Fi, you can make collateralized loans against your NFT. So you can buy a really expensive NFT, take out a loan against it, pay that loan back, and you still have your NFT. So really, really interesting what's going on there. Now, the New York Knicks have issued tickets on the blockchain on Polygon's blockchain. So through the Matic blockchain, there's these commemorative NFTs. So you can you can buy the ticket, gives you access to the game, but then you have your NFT, which you can resell. Now, some people may say, well, that's not a big deal. But let's say you have a, a ticket from the, the Los Angeles Lakers versus the Celtics in the 70s. You have the original stub, not even broken in half. People will pay money for that. So it's, it's kind of the same idea with this type of NFT. Now, I am a huge NBA Top Shot fan. I like the NBA. Playing this clip here of this Chris Paul moment where he broke somebody's ankles in, in the 2021 playoffs. And if you don't know NBA Top Shot, they sell moments, NFTs, digital NFTs of clips of NBA players. And so I know some people don't get it. They're like, I can just watch that on YouTube or I can go to NBA TV and rewatch the game. But you're buying a piece of the blockchain. You're buying that IP. Well, not necessarily through Top Shot because they own the IP, but you do own that moment. It's, it's verifiable on the blockchain. Now, some people are like, well, I'm just not going to spend money on that. I'm just not going to do it. But Infinite Objects has partnered with 
NBA Top Shot. And now you, if you can't see this, if you're just listening to this, there are these plaques that you can buy with an NFT stored in it. So there's a few of them with sports teams like this Lakers one here. But then there's the 2020 NBA champions, limited editions, limited to 250. And you can place this NFT on your desk or on your wall. So one of the biggest arguments about the NFTs is like, well, why would I buy something where I can just go to YouTube? But now to have a physical representation of your NFT, that is constantly running. So imagine having that on your coffee table. Somebody comes to your house, anything that's on the coffee table is, is always a talking piece. That's why people put stuff on their coffee table. Or if you buy a really big one, let's say the size of a 55 inch TV, you have some really cool NFT that's in it, it's constantly playing. People are gonna ask, well, why do you have this on the wall? What What is this? Great talking piece. This is a limited edition. One of one, one of 100, one of 250 is extremely rare. I own one of these. So the exposure that's going to come from things like this and these partnerships is really important. Very, very important. So hopefully that that gives a further reason for you to maybe get in the NFT space. There are some other cool projects that are coming out. And I'm going to touch on that on our next podcast or our next show. But just just really start to dig into this space because this is going to bring a lot of people who wouldn't have interacted with the blockchain, with crypto, with NFTs before, but they're already hooked with other products. So this is a, a really good one. Some things to look out for is Theta. Really big fan of Theta token, t what they're doing there. Mainnet 3.0 is out. They're coming out with something that's called a T-Drop token. And it's specifically for their NFTs and I think this was just yesterday if you are holding and staking theta you're going to get t drop token issued in february 2022 so not financial advice but something worth looking into chain link chain link is crushing it chain link is an oracle service amongst other things but they have partnerships with so many other protocols and they have come out with some things fss ccip that's going to take that's just going to have to be a show in itself but they are basically going to be the internet of blockchains are they going to make the internet of blockchains possible so one of the issues in blockchains right now is that many of them only communicate with their blockchain so if you have coins on or tokens on one blockchain you have to do certain things to either sell it and then buy another one but what if you can just bridge everything together it's kind of like the internet what if Google.com was something totally separate from nobody uses Yahoo.com. Uh, but, you know, let, let's just use that example. So let's say you had to. The only way that you can get to Google is you, if you had to go through Internet Explorer. And let's say I'm going to use an old example. Let's say you had to use Netscape to get on to Yahoo.com. And then you had to pull up an AOL.com uh, browser <laughs> in, in order to, to access Wikipedia. So that's that's kind of how blockchains are right now. You have to do you can only do this on this blockchain. You can only do that on black blockchain. But Chainlink wants to make all that seamless. And so this is very important. So we'll we'll be following up on that. And then Cardano. Cardano is they're getting ready for Alonzo. Uh, they're starting to build things for bridges to other platforms. They are building out the NFT platform the DeFi platform, so many things with Cardano, and then just their partnerships with governments in Africa and South America, they're, they're just, Cardano's crushing it as well. So that pretty much wraps up what we're going to talk about today. Again, if you haven't, I hope you liked what you heard today. Please like, follow, subscribe. Uh, it really helps. I'm, I'm constantly creating content. Let me know about any content that you want to see. Also, you can check out our website, www.buckleytechservices.com, or you can contact me at info at buckleytechservices.com. So shoot me a message. Maybe there's something uh, else that you want to hear about, something that you heard today that you'd like to know more about. Or if you're interested in having a one-on-one -on -one session or me coming out and speaking uh, to your group, company, just uh, let me know. Hey, hit me up. Uh, but I always like to leave with just a, a little something uh, at the end. By now, you know, I like to leave some either inspirational quote, scripture thing 
things like that. But just want you to know that no matter what you do or don't do, that you're special. And you, you were special before you were even created, before you were even born, you're special. So whatever you take down in your heart and, and these messages that I get, I, I am not a creator of these things. A lot of times it's inspired by something else that I heard. But I, I heard something on Stephen uh, Furtick's channel and he was just talking about how you, you are enough. And what are you taking into your heart? What have you held on to? A lot of times when we are criticized, we hold on to that. We hold on to that more than we hold on to compliments. We hold on to that more than the accolades. We hold on to that more than our talents, our gifts, our skills. But what have you held on that is negative? I know sometimes if I'll do a, a presentation, for example, I'll do one of these sessions, I'll get a hundred good comments, but that one negative comment will ring louder than any other. So do you have a tendency to do that? Is there something that somebody told you before and it just, it just crushed your spirit and you've held on to that and you made it your truth? Well, let that go because that is not the truth about you. So don't allow somebody else's opinion to become your truth. You, can, you have the ability to create your truth and you know the truth about yourself. And even if you've lied to yourself or you told yourself some of those negative things that you're holding on to, you have the ability to let that go. So God is well pleased with you. And just know that before you were born, he looked at you and thought of you as well pleased. So just know that he's well pleased with you. So be well pleased with yourself. So that's all I have today. Again, I hope this was beneficial. Thank you for tuning in. Goodbye.